Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, Welcome to, to August, August 1st, 1st Sacramento, Sacramento Aquarium, Aquarium Society meeting. meeting. I, I am Wiley Peck, the president. This is Riker, my grandson. I'm babysitting, so he's presenting with me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick roll call. Uh, our vice president is Josh Black. Treasurer is Modesta Mori. Secretary is Dan Curran. Our Board of Governors are Willie and Aaron Markley, Ben C., Jonathan Wardrip, Stan Morey, Larry Shankle, and Donna Laird. I'd like to uh, welcome all our newest members who joined this month. Uh, Alex Sharp, Michael Palmasano, Keegan Black, Mercedes Ross, Doug Pluta, Randy and Linda Hofford, Joseph Cardoza, Lena Engelhart, Annabelle Collins, Brandon Carson, Jason Parker, and April Allen. Uh, all of them joined us this month. Make sure everybody reaches out and say hello. Um, I would like to announce that the winners of this month's drawing for gift cards uh, are Linda and Randy Hofford and April Allen. Uh, Modesta will be reaching out to you to make arrangements uh, for you to pick your cards and get them to you. This is a reminder to everyone that monthly we do a drawing for new and re-upping members. Uh, if you renew your membership or a new member joins, they are automatically entered to win a gift card to one of our local partner stores. Um, and we do drawings every month and then automatically uh, draw names from those new members and announce them at the meeting online like this. Um, I want to mention that uh, I have added about seven new items to the Tea uh, Teespring store uh, in the last two weeks, including four new masks, uh, a fanny pack, a couple new t-shirts, and a couple other oddball things. Um, there'll be a promo code put into the meeting off and on uh, tonight for 20% off. And that'll be good through uh, the end of the weekend uh, that this is happening on. Um, and then there is also a 15% uh, promo code in our Facebook uh, group for the rest of the time. So if you are seeing this after the, the normal 20% expires, you can go into the Facebook group and find a coupon code there for the rest of the time. So I definitely uh, uh, hope everybody reaches out and tries to pick something up that definitely helps us with income. Uh, since we're not having meetings, that's how we're making money right now. So we need everybody's help. Um, next month, uh, we are going to be having a tour of Rich Byerly's, uh, fish building. Um, and if those of you that don't know, he literally has an entire warehouse, <laughs> big garage fish building. So, um, we are looking forward to that. Um, it took some arm twisting, but he finally agreed. So that's next month. Um, let me take a look at my list, make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, so you will see uh, a couple posts here and there throughout the night with links to donation uh, link and for the Teespring. Um, normally the club does make its income via uh, the monthly auctions since we're not having meetings in person. We're not having auctions. So we are currently not having much of an income to cover costs. So it definitely is a big help from all of you for purchasing uh, products through the Teespring or making donations to the club. Uh, we are still doing uh, BAP and HAP donations. Um, and you can reach out to Larry uh, Shankel, uh, if you want to participate in that, and he will be uh, gladly uh, able to point you in the right direction and help you get all that done. Uh, we will be doing a test 
virtual auction uh, towards the end of the month. Um, we'll have some details coming here in the next couple of weeks uh, on Facebook to uh, get a few participants to, to give a test run. So uh, look for that. Uh, in the next two to three weeks, and hopefully we can uh, have a good luck with that. So that being said, I'm going to shut up now, and we're going to bring Michael and our guest, Dr. Ron Coleman, on and get this party started. So all of you have a wonderful and great evening, and let's enjoy this, and I will talk to you again in a little bit. Awesome. So what's up, everyone? This is our guest, uh, Dr. Ron Coleman, and we're about to go tour his, uh, his, his facility at Sac State here in a minute. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to introduce him, and I'm going to throw him on, and I think I got the audio fixed this time, so let me know if the audio uh, isn't working. So we're going to throw that up, if I can add, there we go. All right, and then we're going to dip out. Hello, my name is Christy Coleman, and today I'm here with Ron Coleman to ask him a few questions and do a little interview for the Sacramento Aquarium Society. Hello, my name is Christy Coleman, and today I'm here with Ron Coleman to ask him a few questions and do a little interview for the Sacramento Aquarium Society. Hi, Ron. Hi, Christy. Sorry we, uh, we couldn't actually be in the lab. Um, the talk is about the Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes lab, but um, because of the virus situation, um, she's not allowed in the lab. So we're going to do this uh, interview here in our backyard and the cats may appear, <laughs> come and go. And uh, then we're going to splice in some footage of um, 
some of the fish and some of the stuff that's going on in the lab. So Ron, can you tell me how you got started with fish? So um, yeah, how did I get started with fish? It's kind of interesting. Um, I, as a kid, I didn't have any pets, like no cats or dogs, and I, um, I got a fish tank when I was about 10. And I started out with uh, what most people do, uh, a sword tail, um, uh, a little puffer fish, and I quickly learned that you can't keep puffer fish with sword tails. Um, so I, I started out with this, this tank, and uh, then when I uh, went to university, I um, was interested in biology, I took a lot of courses, and during that time, I actually was working during the summer and on the weekends at the Vancouver Aquarium, which is a public aquarium up in uh, British Columbia, Canada. And I got more and more interested in fishes the more I worked there because the, the incredible diversity, the, the just all sorts of different colors and sizes and the things that they do, I just found that really, really fascinating. And I actually, um, at that point, I, I knew I was going to be a biologist and I thought that I was going to study uh, wildebeest on the Great Plains of Africa. That was one of my goals in life, to study the wildebeest. And then I had a professor, uh, uh, Professor Sinclair, who actually did study the wildebeest on the Great Plains of Africa. And he would tell us a little bit what it's like. And it wasn't quite as glamorous as I thought, because um, one of the things about wildebeest is they run away from you. And uh, then you have to chase them, and then they run away again. And then um, he also made us realize that when you have, uh, I don't know if you know, many of you are perhaps a little familiar with horses. If you have one or two horses around a barn, you know that they can create quite a bit of uh, dust and mess and, and stuff. Well, just imagine 20,000 horse-sized animals all together. It's not a pretty sight and it doesn't smell good. So I thought, yeah, um, maybe that's not what I want to do. But then there were these fishes, and these fishes, they just kept being more and more kinds. And one of the things I, I learned to uh, appreciate was that you can keep fishes in a tank, or you can study them in the wild, or as I like to do, you can do both. And so um, that's, uh, that's really got me, what got me interested in fishes. Okay, well, can you tell me about the evolutionary ecology of fishes lab that you run? So, yeah, the, um, the, the, the Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes Lab, that started in uh, 2001 when I got my job at Sac State. I had just finished a, a postdoc at uh, UC Berkeley where I worked with George Barlow. And uh, George Barlow is a very famous uh, uh, animal behavior, uh, fish animal behavior person, ichthyologist. And he studied um, the Midas cichlid for most of his life, both in the lab and in the field. And I really liked that approach. And so I set up the Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes Lab uh, with the idea that we would study mostly uh, fishes, mostly things about their evolutionary, evolutionary ecology, which is um, such things as the parental care, the reproduction, a little bit about uh, how they eat, uh, foraging, predation, those, those sorts of things, other aspects of life history. And that's what we've mostly uh, focused on over the years. Um, I have had um, many, many students. Um, couldn't tell you exactly right now. The count is somewhere around 170, 180 undergraduate and graduate students that have worked with me over the years. Um, not all of them have worked with, uh, with fishes. I've had students work on everything from uh, lichens, uh, plant things, and uh, to um, uh, amphibians, several students on amphibians. I've had a, a couple of students working on uh, mammals. In fact, one of my students right now works on a local mammal called the ringtail, which uh, a lot of people are not familiar with, but it's a, it's a secretive local animal that people should know more about. It's, it's, it's an animal that's increasingly in, in trouble because we are dividing up its habitat and they don't cross highways very well. And that's actually what we're, we're interested in is how they are spread throughout the, the foothills and the Sierra Buttes and that sort of stuff. So we do things like that. And, and partly why I do things like that is because they connect to some of the same questions that were interested in fishes in the wild. So I uh, do work in the wild in Costa Rica um, 
every year since uh, 1996. I've spent uh, three weeks to a month or so down in Costa Rica. This year's going to be interesting. We'll see what happens. Usually at the end of December. And we study, um, my students and I study uh, cichlid fishes there. So uh, in the lab, we, well, in the wild, we can see things that go on. We can collect certain kinds of data, but mostly what we see is how these fishes actually work in the wild. And then we can bring those um, situations back into the lab and try and do interesting experiments uh, with the fishes on mostly on their parental care and their reproduction to understand uh, what they do. And about how many tanks do you have in your lab? So yes, we have, uh, we have quite a few fish tanks in the lab in order to do all this work. Uh, right now there's about 170 uh, fish tanks, sometimes more, sometimes less. A lot of them are 20 gallon longs. That's probably my favorite uh, fish tank. Uh, for the lab, it's sort of a nice compromise between uh, not too small and uh, it's big enough that, that we can get things done and that we can get quite a number of tanks in the lab. All of them are uh, separate tanks. We don't have a, a flow through water system, so all of them uh, require individual uh, aquarium maintenance, much like you would do at home, you know. Uh, siphon them out, clean the sponge filter, clean the glass, all that kind of stuff has to be done all the time. <laughs> so um, that's what we do. And um, we keep about, right now, there's about 65 species of cichlids in the lab. So we have uh, a lot of uh, species. We have only one tank full of them. Uh, sometimes just a couple of individuals and other times we have several tanks of them so that's uh, and so these uh, fish they're used in my experiments and in the experiments of of my students and so right now I have um, about eight master's students uh, of those uh, just a couple of them are actually working on the cichlids other are working others are working on projects uh, outside of the lab in the field on various things and then I have, uh, it, it depends on the semester, but 10 to 15 undergraduates who are working with me on a few um, of these uh, mostly cichlid related projects. I'm sure you have a favorite. Which is your favorite fish? My favorite fish? Um, yes, I have, I would have to say I have two favorites. Um, the one favorite, uh, they're not the most colorful, uh, but they are definitely one of the most interesting when it comes to behavior, and that is the convict cichlid. Um, as people in the hobby are prone to say, if you get a pair of convict cichlids at the auction and in a bag, uh, sometimes they may have bred by the time you get them home. And that's one of the things I, I love about them is that they're very eager to breed and they are a great fish for uh, my particular situation. Uh, which is to try and to to introduce a lot of young people uh, into the ways how do we do research, actual research. It, it's one thing to read about it, another thing to think about it, and yet something completely different to actually do it. And uh, there's there's a lot of practice involved and things never go right, but if you start with the convict cichlid, you will greatly improve your odds. So um, we have always a lot of convict cichlids in the lab and um, how we breed them. Uh, we, we have a, a 20 gallon tank, uh, some gravel in there, uh, a flower pot, maybe three plastic plants and uh, a male and a female. And the, the, the beautiful thing about convict cichlids is that um, I can take a student who has never even kept a fish before in their life. They have no experience with fish and in many cases, they are able to actually spawn the pair of convict cichlids within two weeks. And they get to see the, 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 the pair court, their colors change, they get to see that, they get to see them, uh, they don't always see them actually spawn because sometimes the fish spawn first thing in the morning or late in the evening or something like that or when the students are in class, but they'll, the student will come in and there will be a bunch of fish eggs and uh, it's, it's magical every time for the first time a student sees it. 
a, a lot of times they don't even notice them the first time because as, as people who, who have spawned uh, substrate spawning cichlids know, these eggs are um, they're, they're pretty transparent, they're pretty hard to see and if you don't know what you're looking for you could easily miss them. And of course um, the fish will sometimes play games, they're supposed to lay these eggs in the flower pot, at least that's what we tell them to do, but sometimes they lay them on the glass or uh, they dig out a little hole and lay them on the, the, the bottom of the glass or on the, uh, the base of the plastic plants. So they'll do other things and that's all part of the training of the students is to realize that you can plan all you want but these are alive animals and they're going to do what they're going to do. So we attempt to direct them to do things that the way we would like but they do what they're going to do and then we have to deal with that. And so um, we can then uh, do all sorts of interesting uh, experiments. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, but the convict cichlid is fabulous. And they're, they're relatively inexpensive and you can usually get them at uh, pet stores. You, you may have to look around, but, but they're usually there. My other favorite, um, my other favorite, um, that would have to be a uh, Central American cichlid called uh, Tomocicla tuba. Uh, tuba is a large fish about yay big that I have studied since 1989 in the rivers of northeastern uh, Costa Rica. It's, it's a rainforest fish and um, I really just I really appreciate that fish. It lives in fast moving water. They lay very large eggs and a great parental care and the babies have these wonderful um, bumblebee stripe pattern and uh, they're just a, a wonderful fish to work with in the wild. You can get very close to observe them, I can videotape them, uh, all sorts of things like that. Now it is hard to work with them in the lab because first of all they're very hard to get although increasingly they are available um, but they do grow quite large and they really need moving water. This is not a fish that you would find in um, still water. This is a fish that lives in fast moving rivers and that's one of the things I like about them is their incredible uh, swimming ability and their ability to survive in this fast moving rainforest rivers. Can you tell me about some of your current projects that you're doing? Current projects, yes. We've got, uh, well, the, the things are constantly changing in the lab. As students come in, they do a project, uh, hopefully they complete it and then um, we, we transition to the next project. Some projects have been going on for a very, very long time. There's one project I've been doing for almost 20 years. Um, let's see, uh, I'll tell you about just a few of them, some of the, the interesting ones. I mean, we've got uh, from, uh, because we have a, a large number of, of species, one of my students, Lee, who's just graduated, was working on um, doing some molecular work, uh, looking at their DNA to try and figure out the relationships between these um, uh, some of the Central American cichlids. And then on a finer level, uh, one of my graduate students, Sasha, has been working for several years on trying to understand the relationships amongst different populations of one particular uh, cichlid. And so we're, she's again using these molecular techniques to see if we can sort out uh, the, which, the fish in which river are more closely related to the fishes in other rivers. So that's an ongoing project. Uh, I'll tell you about one that just finished, uh, Colleen Moore. She just finished her master's with me. She graduated in the spring and she did a, a really interesting uh, lab experiment on parental care in the convict cichlids. Now, um, Colleen had come uh, to Costa Rica with me and seen how these fish work in the wild and that inspired her to design and carry out a really cool lab experiment. So what happens in the wild is you'll have a pair of convict cichlids. This is what we call biparental care. The two parents both take care of the kids and we're, we're interested at, in the uh, parental care at the uh, fry phase here. So they've got free swimming fry. And so a pair of these convict cichlids will be in the river and they'll have their fry and as the fry get uh, past the first swimming, they start to move around in, in they get up in the morning out of the nest and they start swimming around 
in the river, and the parents basically follow them. You know, and on the first few days, the parents are probably hurting them more, and then after a while, it's more that the parents are just trying to keep up with this this uh, school of, of little fry that is swimming around. Well, what will happen is you'll have one set of parents with their school of fry here, and you'll have maybe upstream, about eight or ten feet, another nest with another pair with their school of fry, and they're moving around, and this pair is moving around, and you can see it's, it's like one of those inevitable something's going to happen here because they slowly move towards each other, and then at some point the two schools run into each other. And this is a, a, a moment of great drama uh, because there's the potential for the babies to get mixed up with each other, and there's a whole bunch of interesting research on that by Brian Wisenden. Um, but what we're really interested in is what do the parents do? You've got one set of parents here and one set of parents here, and they don't get along with the other one, so they're going to attack each other. And what Colleen was very interested in is which parent of this pair attaches attacks which parent of this pair. And one of the uh, interesting things that we have others and, and we have noted over the years is that in these pairs, the male is almost always um, a, a chunk bigger than the female. She's maybe, he's maybe a, a couple of centimeters bigger than, than the female. So if, you know, male's about that big, female's about that big, same over here, male and female. And what she was very interested in is something we saw, and I have seen for many, many years, is that when these two pairs come together, they're very picky about which parent attacks which other parent. And to uh, cut to the chase, the big male always attacks, pretty much always attacks, the other big male, and the little female lines up with the other female. They, they choose their partners and they go at it. And if they're not arranged in a convenient way, they'll switch positions so that they can make it. So the big one attacks the big one and the little one attacks the little one. And now how she actually did this in the lab was really cool. She made a model. We, we have used models for many years in my research where we make a picture of a fish on a stick and we threaten parents with babies in a fish tank, and I also do this in the wild. Uh, well, she made a model that had two fish on it of different sizes, and she would attack um, parents and babies in the lab with this and showed that they are, in fact, very, very particular about which parent attacks which parent. So that was just a really cool experiment, and we're just, just writing that up for publication now. Very, very cool work. Um, in terms of the undergraduate experience, I have uh, some students doing individual projects. I have uh, Haley is working on um, what happens to fish eggs when they get unusually cold and it's surprising. So I'm just going to leave that there. It really surprised us what happens. So she is doing that project. That's, that's part of a summer research, fall research thing. And um, the bulk of my undergraduate students work on one big project called the Cichlid Fry Project. And the idea of this project is we're very interested in why there is so much variation in the egg size of uh, cichlids. They come from teeny, teeny, tiny ones to great big ones. Uh, the tiny ones are, are less than a millimeter in diameter, and the large ones are, for some of the species like the Trophius and some of the other uh, Lake Tanganyika species, the Frontosa, and some of the Cyprochromus, they're, you know, four millimeters in diameter. They're very, very large. So that's not just bigger in one dimension, that's bigger in three dimensions. So there's just a a ton more material in one of those great big eggs. And with almost 2,000 species of cichlids, there is egg sizes spread throughout those extremes, which is fascinating to me. Why does one species make a little teeny tiny egg and another species makes a slightly bigger egg and so on, all the way up to these species that make these very large ones. Now, of course, as you can imagine, and anyone who has bred these fishes knows, if you uh, make a very large egg, you generally don't make very many. And this is one of the challenges of working with the, the large egg mouth brooders, 
is they may only have three or four or five eggs at once. Um, whereas one of the species that lays tiny eggs might have 300, even if the fish is, is not very large, so, or even more eggs than that. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of variation in egg size and there's trade-offs of this that uh, if you make big eggs, you don't get many. If you make little eggs, you get a lot. And so we are interested in, well, what are the advantages of different sized eggs a and the costs? We do experiments on all of this, but this current project is saying, what is one of the key advantages to making a bigger egg? What, what does the parent get out of it? And as you would imagine, big eggs make big babies, big fry. And that's one of those things that's, that's relatively easy to say. It, it makes sense. But the way science works is that you can't just say it and believe it. You've got to prove it. And we have been uh, involved in the last five years in showing this uh, very, very precisely. Um, so how this works is um, we get a species of fish and we breed it. We get a sample of those eggs, which we preserve for measuring later. And we, we take only a portion of the eggs that are made. The rest, we allow the parents to raise them up or we raise them up, depends on the situation. Uh, and this, these could be both uh, substrate spawners or mouth brooders. We raise them up until the point at which they are first swimming. And then we again take a sample, sample which we preserve and then we measure all of these things very, very carefully under the microscope to a tenth of a millimeter, so very precisely. And what we have shown uh, with, um, it's taken almost five years now and about 55 different students have actually worked on this project. Uh, a lot of fish breeding. Um, the relationship is incredibly tight. What I mean by that is if you were to tell me the size of the egg, I can tell you exactly how large that fry will be when it first swims. And so we started with um, the substrate spawners, the fish I'm most familiar with, the Central Americans, uh, the West African cichlids, uh, those kinds of fish, South American uh, substrate spawners. We started with those and we have a lot of data there. And then um, a couple of years ago, we branched out to, to looking at the mouth brooders. And the question was, do the mouth brooders show the same relationship? And yes, the, the bigger mouth brooder eggs do make bigger fry, but is it, uh, the, the technical word is, is it the same slope? Is, is the relationship exactly the same slope? Are they, are they doing exactly the same thing? And my student, uh, Brianne Benitez, has, has been breeding mouth brooders uh, along with myself. And um, it's exactly the same relationship, which is very interesting. That tells us that mouth brooding isn't really as different is what we might have thought. Uh, yes, the parent does have the babies in the mouth, but um, what it does for the egg, it doesn't do anything more or anything different than what a substrate spawner does. It just, mouth brooder fry are big because mouth brooder eggs are big. And where we've been uh, particularly able to test this is by breeding some of the substrate spawners that have the very largest eggs, and those would be species like the Steatocranus, the buffalo heads, have unusually large eggs for substrate spawners, and there's a few others. And then breeding some of the mouth brooders that have very small eggs for uh, mouth brooders, and those eggs are actually smaller than the eggs of the buffalo heads. So, and this, so we can see the clear uh, overlapping relationship. We're continuing on that. We, we, we need a, a, some more data on, on the mouth bitter eggs. Uh, those are a little harder for us to work with. We're, we're not as familiar with the, the Malawi and the Tanganyikan mouth brooders. So that's a, more of a learning curve for us. Um, one aspect that we've been getting into a lot lately is there is this other group of cichlids that are um, very intriguing. And that is the ones that lay the eggs on the substrate but then pick them up and mouth brood them. And so we increasingly have been uh, accumulating these species in the lab 
and as far as the data shows so far, they actually fall exactly where we would expect in the middle between these other two groups. So that's, uh, that's one of our, our main projects that keeps us busy, that keeps a lot of the fish tanks full, and a lot of the, the students are busy. Um, basically, they, they maintain their tanks, they watch their fish, uh, they try and catch when the fish spawns, and uh, get those samples, and then um, get the, uh, the, the fry when they first free swimming. And it doesn't always work. <laughs> okay, it doesn't always work. So, for instance, um, I had discus many, many years ago, and uh, I've always wanted to try them again, partly for this egg uh, project, but partly because of their parental care is so fascinating. And uh, thanks to Anthony Mazarol down at Soka University, I, uh, he managed to give me a couple of beautiful pairs of, of discus. And uh, I've had them for, I guess, about a month now. And um, every day, it looks like it's going to be the day they spawn. And uh, yesterday was the day that uh, one of the pairs spawned, which was fantastic. But it turned out that the male didn't do his part and the eggs were not fertile. And so this is a big part of uh, lab science. It's a big part of aquarium keeping. It, it doesn't always work as, as you have planned. And so the discus is an example of that. So we'll keep on it and hopefully uh, they'll spawn again in the near future and we'll get some, some fertile eggs. Um, we have a number of fish in the lab, which um, we, when we get them in and a student gets to work with them and they are able to spawn them in uh, sometimes a relatively short period of time. Many of these species I have spawned myself in the past, so I know little tricks like whether this species likes a, a flat piece of slate or, or a cave or a tunnel or something like that. Others are species I have never spawned. And so that's really wonderful for one of the students when they spawn a fish, which I have never spawned. And we learned something, you know, we didn't expect that to happen. And um, that's really cool. An example of that is the, the Steatocranus, the buffalo heads. Lots of hobbyists breed buffalo heads. They're not that tricky to spawn. But when you ask them, well, did you see the eggs? Almost no one ever sees the eggs of um, buffalo heads. They're rather secretive about how they spawn. They particularly seem to like to spawn in upside down coconut shells. I don't know if there's anything like the coconut where they're found in West Africa, but uh, they like these shells and they're quite secretive. And yet when you do see the babies, they're huge. And that's because they really lay these very large eggs. Well, there's a number of species in the lab, which um, we've kept them for a while, sometimes three, four, five years. Uh, some have never spawned. We've got some like that. Others um, spawn all the time, but we never see the eggs. And an example of that would be Nanacara anomala little wonderful little dwarf cichlid from uh, from South America um, I have a tank full of them the interesting thing is I didn't put a tank full of them I didn't put that many in the tank I put just a few in the tank but there's a lot of them there now and that's because they spawn and they raise their kids and we only ever see them when they've got little fry I know uh, from previous work that they have very, very tiny eggs. And from other work, which I, I won't talk about today, uh, we know that those eggs hatch very quickly. Uh, at, at warm temperatures, it may even be in, in under two days. So um, they spawn in little caves. The eggs are very hard to see and they hatch very fast. And so as a consequence, we've never managed to get the sample of eggs to go with the fry. So with fish like that, we just, we just keep working on it. Um, there's a bunch like that. There are a bunch of other ones like, um, oh, just some of the things like the, uh, the Nanochromus transvestitis, a beautiful West African cichlid, <clears throat> which we just haven't managed to spawn yet, but we're hopeful. People always ask me, what fish would you like to work with in the future? And uh, as I said, we're, we're getting more into some of the Tanganyikan uh, species 
uh, some of the Malawi fish. Um, this is not my area of expertise. My expertise is, is uh, Central South America and uh, West Africans. And so um, we're, we're working on it. It's, it. There's a learning curve there. So uh, that, that is something that is, uh, that is a challenge. And as I mentioned earlier, they don't have very many eggs. And so uh, this is one of the, the, the challenges that Brand, for, in, for instance, faces. If one of these um, species lays um, 10 eggs, and she's very, very good at getting the eggs out of the mouth. This is something that um, she hadn't done two years ago. She'd never kept a fish. Now she can get the eggs out of even the tiniest female in just a matter of seconds. She, she's learned how to do it very quickly, get the female back in the tank, no harm done. Uh, but we then have to decide what are we going to do if there's only 10 eggs, we need to preserve some of them so that we know how big the egg size was, but we need to keep a bunch of them to get them to hatch and then ultimately to become free swimming. So maybe we preserve two and then we try and raise up the other eight and we use these um, um, a hatchery devices. We've tried many different egg tumblers these ones are cobalt ones we're particularly fond of. They don't actually make them anymore, but they allow us to control very well uh, what's going on in there. They're, they were, I guess, very expensive, which is why they maybe didn't catch on, but they do work very well and we can see exactly what's going on. And then we, we try and uh, get those eggs raised up to the, to the free swimming stage. So um, we would like to work with some of those. There are some sort of holy grail fish. There's the heterochromus multidens, which is a, a really cool um, a cichlid from West Africa, which was never in the hobby, but has appeared in the hobby in the last uh, couple of years. They're really, really expensive. So we'll see, maybe in the future. And of course, you know, with almost 2,000 species, there's always another cichlid to, uh, to spawn. And what about the virus situation? How has that affected the lab? So the COVID-19, has been an interesting thing for us, as it has for everyone. Um, fortunately, uh, as soon as this thing started happening in California, the governor issued a, um, a list of uh, essential services. And one of those uh, are personnel, people who take care of animals. And so I am authorized to uh, go to work every day and take care of the fish, uh, which I do. Um, of course, normally I would have, you know, 10, 15 students helping out, and that's really not been possible uh, during this crisis. I, we've had a little bit of help here and there, uh, but for a lot of it, it's basically me and the fish. And so uh, if you think it takes a bit of effort to take care of one tank or two tanks, um, try 170 of them <laughs> uh, while you're teaching courses as I, as I am even now. I'm teaching two courses right now in the summer. And so there's 170 fish tanks that need to be, uh, you know, fed and, and uh, maintained. And so if in some of the video that uh, is interwoven here, you see a little bit of dirt on the ground or um, some algae on the glass, that's why. Now there's other reasons for that. Actually, I often leave algae in the tanks because the babies like to eat it, but, um, but maintenance is, is a challenge. We don't really know how this whole thing is going to play out. So um, we probably won't have a lot of the students back in the lab, uh, not in large numbers for a while. We are, we, are, we are getting approval for a few students to work intermittently in the lab during the late summer and the fall. And so that will be good for them and, and to continue on with our projects. The fish, of course, they don't know anything about this. They are, they are busy doing what they do. And uh, some of them are, we've got them as very young individuals and they're just growing. So this just allows them time to grow before they'll, they'll breed. So um, that's pretty much what's happening. We'll see, it's, uh, it's unknown for us as it is for, for everyone else. What do you think is in the future for your lab? What is the future of the lab? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, I intend to be uh, doing this for quite a few more years. Um, anyone who's familiar with Sac State uh, will know that we, uh, we built a new science building, which is really cool. 
but it didn't have any space in it for the fish. We, we knew that that wasn't going to be the case. Um, I am in a very, very old building right now, and there are plans, um, sort of, uh, to move the fish lab to a newer building, not the new building, but a newer building. Um, this was all proceeding uh, at a certain pace until the coronavirus hit, and now we're kind of, uh, we're a little bit of a pause on that to see how that's going to, uh, going to work out. So. Uh, we don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Do you have fish at home? Ah, yes. Do I have fish at home? <laughs> yes. Well, Christy can attest to the fact that uh, even though I have 170 fish tanks at work, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have about 15 tanks at home. And uh, every day, Christy feeds them, which is very nice. Uh, so she feeds the fish, and they know her as the person who's going to feed them and so they respond very much to her. Uh, I have a number of different species there. Some of them are, are much larger tanks than what I'm able to have at uh, work. And I think right now, probably one of my favorite tanks is the living room tank, which is a uh, 155 gallon uh, bow front tank. And in it, I have um, Uwaru Fernanda Yepezi, uh, the beautiful Uwarus from South America. And they started out as little guys about this big, and there are nine of them. And now they are getting on about that big, and they are wonderful. They are black and white uh, with some subtle yellows in their fins. And they're, they're, they're not adults, but they're just getting on the edge of being young adults. And we're really hoping to see uh, some of them spawn in the not too distant future. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much uh, for uh, interviewing me, and I hope that uh, people from the Sacramento Aquarium Society uh, enjoy this. And good luck with your fish keeping, and stay safe. All right, and I think we have Ron on. Yes, I'm back here. Perfect. Awesome, let me get all set in and let me dig for the questions because I know they're all the way at the top. And good to know I nailed the audio this time too. <laughs> you know, I'm great at that. Uh, let's see, almost, I know there's a question here somewhere. Uh, do you have anything you wanted to say right off the bat, Ron? Oh, um, yes. Uh, go visit your local fish store. <laughs> okay. Um, these, 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 I, I was at, at some today. Um, you know, it's it's a difficult time for all businesses, but uh, a lot of the fish stores are open. You know, you wear your mask and the fish are there. And uh, it's something you can do that, you know, keep the, ho the hobby going during these, uh, these challenging times. So, so please go visit your local fish store. Yeah, definitely. All right, and I finally found our questions, finally got to it. First one's from Dan uh, Curran. Uh, when bringing an aquarium plant to an auction, what's the ideal amount of water to put in the bag? Gallons and gallons. <laughs> For those who don't know, whenever I bring a water sprite, which is the only plant I'm able to grow other than plastic plants, um, I like to bring them in a lot of water so that they, they feel like they're in an aquarium. Other people bring them dry, and I, I think that probably hurts the plant's feelings. So. I like to give them lots of water. And, and then when you buy something, you, you get the water as well as the plant. See, and I'm just lazy, so I don't like to plant my plants until like three days after the club meeting. So, you know, if I don't give them water, they're That's just right. going to dry out. So, yeah. yeah. And then this was one from uh, Jonathan Wardrip. Are convicts native to Costa Rica or are they an invasive species? So that is actually a really interesting question. They are definitely native... Um, eastern Costa Rica and up over the north and then in the northwest. The question is, um, they're found in some other spots and we don't know if they are introduced there. And, and why we might suspect that they might be is that there's one spot I know of down in, um, well, it's about the Midwest where uh, we were snorkeling around and we saw a dovey eye down there, which is a big wolf cichlid. And 
there are no WI native there at all. So that tells us that people have been moving some fish. I could easily see why they might move WI because it's a sport fish and uh, you know they get big. Um, whether convicts got moved accidentally, hard to know. They, the, the, the convicts have been introduced all over the planet to different places. I mean, they're in they're in California, they're in Nevada, they're actually up in Canada in hot springs in Canada. So they're in Hawaii. You go to Hawaii and just next to the University of Hawaii campus, there's a little creek, tiny little creek, and there's great big convict cichlids in it. So um, wherever you put them, they'll they'll do very well. They'll find a way to to survive. Yes, they do. All right, and then this next question is a two-part question. Uh, I'm going to say TD because I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, but have you been able to decipher the convict signals to fry? And then the follow-up was, uh, and is their signaling the same uh, for the species, or does it change with various parents? Okay, so that's another one I didn't, um, let's see, I don't have it right with me. Just give me one second. It's okay. Do an experiment. Uh, let's see if I can do this in front. See, it's got a got a little lever here. Okay, this is um, uh, Natalie Flores. Uh, she did this so five six years ago. She's now actually most of the way through her PhD up in um, in uh, University of Vermont. And so uh, here we have a sort of a rubber mold of a fish. And I don't know if I can. Uh, it's, it's getting too old, but if you this string, if when it was new, when you pulled on it, the little fins would wiggle up and down. And so she could, uh, I don't know if I can get it. There. Well, you can see it just a little bit, but you get the idea. So what she was interested in is um, do the kids respond to this? And they do. They respond incredibly to it. And it turns out you don't even really need the fish part. All you really need get in the light here. Let's see over here. Um, all you really need are these little black fins poking down and wiggling. You, you, you could have little little fins suspended in space and the kids when they see those wiggling above their head, they will um, hit the deck and gather, which is just so cool. You, uh, that's one of the things I love about some of the experiments we do in our lab is you can do this at home. You can, it, no, no fish were harmed in the making of these experiments. And, and you can do it at home. And um, one of the things you'll find, uh, she didn't pursue this on her particular project, but we're fairly sure that this is what happens in the wild. So the convicts, the black fins, um, one of the fish that they live in the same area is a fish called alfari. We don't see this very often in the hobby, beautiful fish. Alfari have yellow pelvic fins. And I'll bet you that the convicts will not respond the same way to the yellow, yellow fins flicking as they will to the black. And with the Neatropus, Nematopus, um, they can have these white fins. And so each species has a different um, color pelvic fin. The reason is in these uh, tropical rivers, the water's often really murky and you really can't see very far. Sometimes you can almost feel the fish before you can see them. It, it might be you know, a foot or in the worst case, six inches that you can see. So the little guys are looking up and they're looking to see those little flashing fins to tell them that they need to do something. It's a great question. Perfect. And uh, let's see, uh, the next one, I just lost it. Uh, Jeff's coming in a little little childish here and saying plants are sold by weight, right? Yeah, like that one. I, I sit next to Jeff at the auctions quite a bit. And he's just to sit just next so you to know, I, I, one of my things, I, I do get invited to speak at various uh, clubs around uh, North America. And um, our club is so lucky when we're meeting normally. We have so many plants yeah. that most clubs, you know, they get a little sprig of water sprite. Uh, like I said, that's all I can grow. And that's what they get. And we have so many cool plants. So we get back to it, take advantage of that. It's, that's that's something that a lot of people they don't they don't have that yeah a lot of crypts a lot of like reddish bacopia oh, yeah. type stuff stuff you don't see all over the place lots of big ones little ones the whole range all sorts of stuff yeah, some cool anubias too yes uh, let's see and dan's asking are you working with any cares fish at the moment 
Uh, yes, I have. Um, I tried to take some video of it, but they never video well. Um, Stomatepia, it's a, a West African um, mouth brooder that um, Stomatepia pindu, there's several species, three of them. And I've had this for, I guess it's going on about 15, 16 years now. I think we're in the third generation. So um, I keep them because they're interesting and because there are very few of them. I, I occasionally see them in a few other places, some in Ohio when I was there. But um, they're, they're just absolutely jet black. And you, you can't photograph them because they don't look like anything. And even I tried videoing them and they don't look like anything. So um, they're cool fish. They're, they're very interesting because they're terrible mouth brooders. Absolutely terrible. Uh, your, your typical tilapia type mouth brooder, you, uh, I, I'm, I've worked with tilapia in the Salton Sea. And you take that fish, you catch it in a... In a um, stain net or something like that. We put it in a bucket. We actually transported them. We get permits. We transported them from Southern California all the way up here, 12 hour dot drive. And the mom still had the babies in her mouth. They're just incredible. Okay. The stomatepia, you look at that fish. She spits them out. She says, go, have, go eat them all. Eat them. I'm, I'm just gets too scared, huh? Just, you know, it, it, to try and catch them, you have to like pretend to walk by the tank and then get them without even looking. Because if you look at them, they're like, no, we're, we're getting rid of these kids. She get too scared, so, yeah. Other people have noted the same thing. I don't know what it is about that. It may be why they're not very uh, abundant. <laughs> it's a possibility. And then uh, Jack was pointing out that I uh, I blocked when you said how big your waru are with the video. Yeah, so the, um, the biggest ones are getting on about five inches now. And uh, they, um, they don't have a lot of color. They're kind of, if you like that black and white thing, they're very striking. But they have a lot of personality, I guess a bit like the convicts. And they, um, I'm lucky to have uh, nine of them. And it's, it's just the gang of nine. They, they always hang out as a gang. And if, if one gets separated, it flips back to the rest of them. And they're, they're just wonderful fish. Awesome. And then uh, Matt Adams was saying, how often do you travel to other places besides Costa Rica? I, I don't know if that's necessarily for research or just the, your talkings to the various fish clubs or, or both. Oh, I go on uh, to different fish clubs a few times a year, um, you know, on the East Coast, that kind of thing, in Southern California, uh, Portland, I guess I was in recently, uh, Chicago, that sort of thing. Um, for my research, I've been to uh, Costa Rica, as I say, every, every year, once or twice, um, Panama, uh, a, a little bit in Mexico a few times, and a little bit in uh, Nicaragua. My, uh, my goal is to get down into um, the edge of Colombia, right on the uh, Pacific border with uh, Ecuador down there. Some very cool fish, relatives of the tuba down there. It's I was going to say, and I know your favorite fish was in Costa Rica, but is there a favorite location that you've gone and done research at? In, in Costa Rica? Uh, just in, in the world. Oh, I, yeah, the, the, where, I, where I stay, it's a place called the La Selva... Um, biological station in Costa Rica. It's just fabulous. People can go there. It's just it's just great. The, the people in Costa Rica are wonderful. Um, things will get back to a, to a better place and uh, I encourage you to go. Um, just uh, like, like any time you travel to the tropics, never go with a goal like I'm only going to be happy if I only see like, you know, the jaguar or something like that because then you won't see the jaguar. Just, just go to see whatever you see, and uh, there's so much stuff in Costa Rica, yeah. and, and the people are great. Definitely. And uh, Amazon Research Center, Center for Oramental Fishes asks what the waru are reading, feeding on. I can't talk today. Ah, so that's uh, Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Thank you very much for the discus. I'm going to get them to, to spawn right. Um, well, I have usually, in the lab, I normally feed... Uh, you know, brand placement, tetracyclic, that's what we feed the flake food. And I give blood worms to a, a few of the things. And um, I don't know, I thought, well, they do seem to like, um, supposedly like plant matter. So I got myself some uh, leaf lettuce. And uh, let me get one of these things. Hold on. It's a very visual man. You can definitely tell he's a teacher. There you go. 
Okay. So I end up with I end up with lots and lots of these ATI sponge filter bases. And I was thinking, now how am I going to um, get the, the leaf lettuce into the tank? And I didn't have one of those special clips or anything. Get one of these. Okay, this works fantastic. You take two leaves, squish the base together, stick it in here, put it on the bottom of the tank. Um, I've tried this with a whole bunch of fish now. The first day, they'll look at it. They're like, huh, I don't know what's going on here. The second day, they'll peck at it. With the Uaru now, if I put two foot-long leaves in there, it's gone within a half hour. The whole thing, they just, they mow it down. Feels it, more like it, an actual plant versus something clipped to the side, maybe? Yeah, they love it. And it's fabulous to, fabulous to watch. So try that if you get one of these bases. And, you know, you end up with them, but they're broken and stuff like that. It's, it's another use for it. I don't like to throw anything out. There's always some use for it because it's weighted see so it, it it'll, it'll keep the thing two leaves in there now they will eat the leaves if they're um floating but it's harder because they, they peck at them and it kind of goes away yeah put, put them in here they love them absolutely okay. love them. good little tip and then uh inglorious Beddows was asking what happens when eggs get unusually cold if you can give us a little bit of a preview of that experiment well, okay so i will tell you um don't tell anyone okay uh due to a uh airplane incident where I had some fish eggs with me and they actually end up going through Minnesota in the middle of winter it's best and time they, got, they got down to five degrees Celsius and uh, well I put them in the tank when I got home and they hatched okay so five degrees Celsius is uh, what 45 Fahrenheit something like that yeah, yeah. We now do this regularly. These eggs can survive perfectly fine at temperatures like five degrees Celsius. Or we don't, they, they, it will slow them down. They take a lot longer, but they can be subjected to this for hours. We're pushing it up to like seeing if they can survive 24 hours at that kind of a temperature, which is uh, really amazing to. How other animals, we don't do really well in cold. And yeah, I'm from, not at all. <laughs> they, it doesn't seem to affect them other than slowing them. Huh. Interesting. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's that's good to know. Yeah. And then uh, Rich Burley was asking, what species do you think you need to look at further uh, to further your research? So the trick there are the mouth brooders. Uh, we have a bunch of experiments that require... Um, large eggs of the mouth breeders, of, of the largest mouth breeders. Um, I've never uh, had any luck uh, spawning frontosa. I've never really tried, but the, you know, something like that. I do have a colony of uh, Trophius duguesi that are not quite adult yet. Um, but those, sort, those eggs are really, really big. I have had Cipropromus, which is a little Tanganyikan fish. They're you know, about maybe a couple inches long. Uh, the trouble with Cipochromus is you only get a couple of eggs, and that's not enough for us to uh, to really work with. So we're um, we're uh, we're working on uh, we we need to do more with the with the Trophius and and some of those other um, Tanganyikan fishes. And I think Rich knows that that's not my special. <laughs> and uh, Rich also again asked if you had any S Mongo. I don't. No. 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 I should actually. I should. Um, probably qualify part of that one of the challenges of working in the environment that we work in is um, up until now our philosophy has been we keep fish which work with our water <laughs> you know and that's one way to do it the other way to do it is to make your water match the fish and that's really never been possible for us so, so we've kept fish which Sac State water is great water but it's kind of you know neutral and um it, it's not really ideal for these Tanganyikan fishes. So we have to work a, a, a little harder or a lot harder to get some of those to work. Yeah. And then uh, Dan was asking if tubas are found in all of the Costa Rica rivers or just some of them? No, definitely not. Uh, they are found only in the a, a band. I've actually found the furthest west ones. You go right to the Nicaragua border at the very west. They're up there. And then they sort of a triangle that, that spreads along over 
right across the north and down, because the, the mountains cut across an angle across Costa Rica to the town of, um, basically, it's, um, I can't think of the town. Oh, Limon, a little bit south of Limon. And uh, then they're, they're not there. And then you get down into Panama and you get that beautiful fish called Asfrasi, which um, we used to see in our area, haven't seen in years. And it's the closest relative to the tuba. So it's, it's down there. That's, that's what I was hunting in, in Panama for. Yeah. And then uh, Jonathan asked, have you worked, uh, continue to do any work with any amphia? I don't even know how to say that. Amphilosis. Amphilosis. Yeah, I have a few. Um, so when I first met George Barlow, this is what George was was famous for, working with the Midas cichlids, and they are a fabulous fish. But when the first time I went and visited him at Berkeley, he said, Ron, don't work with Midas cichlids. Don't. <laughs> and, and the reason is, they're big. And um, I remember that first day, he wanted to show me some. He had, he had hundreds of these. And in one case, he was setting up an experiment in a lab, and he had, I think it was about a 20-gallon long tank, and he had one Midas on one side, and another Midas on the other side, and he had metal window screening in between to keep them apart. The one just pushed right through it. It just broke through the metal window screen with no run. It just said, I don't like the other guy. Just boom. <laughs> it just right broke through, through, and that was sort of par for the course. It's a very, very powerful fish, and you need a lot of space. Um, at, at Berkeley, we did have at the time a pond up on the hill where we had 600 adult Midas cichlids. Hmm. It was quite incredible. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah. Big ponds and, like that are especially cool, even if it's big fish, little fish, whatever it is. Oh, they're t and, and the color varieties you would see that would occur, and those were, yeah, they were incredible. That facility, unfortunately, is uh, gone now. Yeah. And then uh, Rich Byerly asked, did you have a student that was able to get stoma, to I'm horrible with these fish names, as you can tell, uh, to, fry for you? To, to get them out of the mouth? I'm assuming so. Um, not yet. No, that's one that uh, uh, only I've done so far. Okay. And then uh, Amazon Research Center for Ornamental Fishes asked, when are you coming to Peru? You know, it's on the list. It's... Um, as everybody knows, it's a, it's a crazy world right now. It's easy and, to uh, travel, right? Yeah, it's um, you know, I mean, there's 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 the difficulties of traveling, and then one of the one of the challenges or joys of my position, I'm at a university, and so it's nice. I don't have to pay for the water, but I do have to follow all the rules, and we have a lot of rules, and one of them is I can't go to Peru. Yep, I get that. Well, anywhere, actually, right now. <laughs> and then, uh, again, I'm horrible at names. TD's asking, is there a way to visit your lab? Okay, so, um, yes, that, that, well, not now. Not okay. at this moment. <laughs> this is, actually, I really want to mention this. I didn't mention this in the video. Really important to me. Um, this is, Sac State is a public university, and I am a public lab in a public university. And at any time that normally people move around you are encouraged and invited to visit the lab just send me an email and say you want to come and see the lab and we have people um all sorts of people kids tours all sorts of people come by to see the fish it's, and it's it, I, I want you to see that we have this here in, in sacramento um one of the interesting things just to give you a little bit of understanding of how universities work is um there's very few labs like this because most We'll call them bigger, I don't know, higher level universities. But, um, they don't have the space for something like this. They, they wouldn't devote the space to this. And uh, smaller universities don't have the space either. So we're kind of in that sweet spot in the middle, at least for now, where we are able to have this facility. And I want you to see it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. It's old, but it works. Hey, as long as it works. Yeah. And then uh, Rich Byerly is asking, what's your favorite venomous snake? Uh, my favorite venomous snake is a snake I have unfortunately have not seen in a long time in the wild, and that's a thing called the Bushmaster, which is um, a beautiful snake that we used to have in northeast Costa Rica. They're, they're very rare now. I'm talking a snake that's nine or ten feet long, and uh, if it bit you, it would be over in seconds. Um, 
but they don't bite people. They really don't. They, they eat rodents, and I've been right next. They just sit there. Um, quite different than the feral answers, the terciopelos, which uh, I have actually seen them chase people. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Inglorious Bettas said Ron has everything in his lab. And uh, another comment to go with that, C.A. Benner, another teacher thing. Save everything, exclamation point. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. And then Inglorious Bettas said, do they go through a type of diapause? I believe that was when we were talking about fish eggs in the cold. No. Um, it's Inglorious Bettas is Jan, right? I believe so, yeah. She said she was a student of yours. Yes, yes, she did wonderful work here. Um, no, it's it's you know it's interesting. There's a, one of the California fishes that's very very interesting, not a cichlid, are the grunion. And at, at other times, you've got and if you've never been, you've got to go down to Santa Monica in the summer and see the grunion spawning on the beach at Santa Monica Pier. You just go down at night and there's these. You got to choose your days, right? The grunion lay their eggs at high tide, and then they hatch again at the next high tide, which is two weeks later. But it doesn't take two weeks for the eggs to develop. So they, they go into this diapause. They go into to like a sort of suspended animation thing, which is really cool. A woman by the name of uh, uh, Karen Martin at uh, Pepperdine studies this. The cichlids don't. They just go slow. They just slow right down. I thought that when they got really cold, they'd slow and stop, and that would be the end of it. And there are other interesting things that we're working on actually right now that the water mold, the saprolegnia fungus stuff, it does well at cold. So there's a battle there between the egg not really having much activity going on and the saprolegnia doing really well. That the saprolegnia usually wins. Yeah. So that's, that's exactly what we're studying right now. Sounds interesting. And then another question from uh, Inglorious Bettis. If the correlation between the size of the egg and the size of the fry is so tight between substrate spawners and mouth breeders, what other factors influence the evolution of these divergent behaviors? So that's, that's the big question. That's what we're trying to figure out. Because for a lot of the history of uh, cichlids, it's sort of been, well, there's the substrate spawners and there's the mouth breeders, like they're doing something really different, and they're really not. It's really just that the, the, the mouth brooders put the egg in the mouth. There's, there's not that much different. That the eggs, one of the things where we actually look at is the, um, the biochemistry of the eggs to see if the insides is really, it's, it's basically the same. Mm. If there's really, and, and that's why, probably why, you can have things like these delayed mouth brooders, which just you know, took that intermediate step of, well, they're on the ground, not a safe spot to be. I better pick them up. There's a lot of issues with that, and um, you know it's. And mouth breeding has evolved multiple times in in the uh, the cichlids. So, and in other fishes, at least 17 times in other fishes. So, it, it, it's really interesting. Oh yeah. And then uh, Larry Shankle's asking, what leaves or other botanics are you using for your uh, tannins, and where are you getting them? So, well, <laughs> the at um, if you exotic. can say <laughs> <laughs> at the med exotic right next to the counter and uh, um, the uh, what do you call it? the Indian um, Indian almond leaf Indian almond leaves yeah yeah you know they make your water a, a little darker we like I said we try not to have to cater to the fish because um, that's more not work. always well it's it's more work and it's difficult to be consistent when you have so many cooks, <laughs> you know, and one person does a water change and then they don't, they even have to do the same thing. So we try to keep, that's why we keep the food fairly simple and we, we don't fiddle with the pH unless we have to. But there's a few species, like one of the species I'm really trying to spawn right now is the um, Ivanacara adokita. It's like the, uh, it used to be the Anacara anomala, the next one over. They're just gorgeous, and I have absolutely gorgeous adults, but no spawning. So we've tried some leaves, we tried, you know, every different kind of pot and fish and tray and algae and no algae. I mean, you know, we, that's what we got to do. We just got to keep trying. So. Yeah, I get that. And then uh, Doug Lee was asking if you have any shell dwellers or played with right. any of those. Don't. I have tried, and I've failed miserably. 
I, you know, and uh, it's it's one of the funny things. I can't breed guppies either. That's I just I just can't breed. I guppies. can't breed guppies either. They die on me I, all the time. I, I, I say I hate to say it to those people. I bought them at the auction. That I bought them, and then they slowly died. Sorry, uh, you know. I mean, they, they'll have a couple of kids, and then and then they're gone. And uh, and um, I don't know. It, it's just some fish I've just not much luck with, and the shell dwellers have never been my thing. But it's something we definitely need to do yeah yeah i like so i just picked some up from uh wiley earlier this week so ah, i'm gonna start playing I, with those they're gonna be fun i just just the last few weeks i've been working with the um the brundy princess the brichardi um that group that mm-hmm. i guess playing from Logos, whether it is now or not and uh i'd never spawned them before and um now i've got them spawning quite regularly but it's another one that has a small egg and we haven't seen the eggs yet, but we have multiple groups of little fry and bigger fry all growing up together as a group. So they're breeding. For our research, we have to see the eggs. And so sometimes they just mess with us. Yeah, I get that. And then uh, Begatine or Eric asked, can you please bring home some wild-caught rainbow cichlids? The ones around here are captive breath imports, lovely fish, but don't feel, don't feel very Central American, if you know what I mean. Yes, yeah, so I, <laughs> I can't bring fish back from Costa Rica. Uh, I'm allowed to do that. The interesting thing about rainbows, so I'll tell you, is that um, there's many different color varieties. The ones that I see in Costa Rica are actually very, very sort of that fish tan, not really very colorful, black stripe down More it. More of a camouflage type look. Yeah, it's like they just kind of blend in. Um, there are other ones that I have seen, like I had some bright orange ones that were just stunning. And I, I could see why those would be called rainbows. But the ones in Costa Rica, you'd be like, well, that's not much of a rainbow. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a rainbow. rainbow of mud. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, C.A. Benner asked, any Trophius um, or other Tanganyika in Malawi cichlid in particular you're working with, um, those that would be available to us as hobbyists? Well, so the, 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 the one, the Trophius that I've worked with, I've had um, the, the Murai um, for many, many years, but I never got any eggs. I had eggs, but I never saw them. And then I've got um, the Malero ones. Uh, the Trophius du Boisai, and I have about, I don't know, about 25 of them growing up at home um and they've just they've changed from the, the little blue starry night speckled gorgeous little babies to getting that sort of brown with the yellow i mean it, it's nice but it's not like the babies but, but that tells me they're getting on to the adult thing so i'm hoping that those will uh will work out yeah and i just had the next question and it just disappeared on me let me find it again sometimes when people talk it jumps all the way to the bottom of the chat <laughs> And Larry's asking, uh, what foods are you using on average to encourage spawning for most of your fish? I know you said you keep it simple. Yeah, so mostly we use tetracyclic. That's, you know, one of the challenges of doing science is that you have to write up your methods and what you can do. And it's difficult to write, well, we fed a little of this, a little of that, and which means, you know, no one else could repeat that. So I can say we fed them tetracyclic and it worked. It's repeatable repeatable and it's it's science. It works that way. It probably is not as good as a nice varied diet but that's sort of what we can do that's repeatable as long as you're getting it to work but and then uh just a little plug right here reminder that wiley is putting up is we have a 20 percent off code for our teespring ends tomorrow at midnight uh the code is right in there and it's been dropped in the chat occasionally um just throwing that out there and then larry also asked uh on average how many species do you and your class spawn per year oh um, well, uh, so there's some that we spawn over and over and over again. Like your um, convicts? Well, convicts, yes. Um, we have spawned probably 300 pairs of convicts in the last five years. Um, we use them in lots of different experiments. Uh, some of the other, like we have uh, Leda carotheri, which we spawn about every two weeks. You know? And then other ones... Um, oh, wait, yeah, just a sec. <laughs> the light's kicking out on you. It, it, it's uh, money saving at the university. The lights go out if you don't move enough, which is an interesting issue when you're trying to raise fish. So um, I would say about new species every year, maybe 15 to 20. 
Yeah, and then uh, Rich just has a funny comment, says his daughter stopped by and said that all the guys have more facial hair than they do at the meetings. And I know I haven't been shaving. I'm normally clean shaven. I think you normally have a beard, though, don't you? I've always, I've been this way since I was like 17, so that's never changed. Yeah. See, this is about as long as I've grown it ever. It wasn't gray when I was 17, but that's just life. Yeah, well, you know, it all works. And then, uh, yes, if you guys don't know who Ron is, Ron runs the, I forget the technical name of your lab at Sac State. So the Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes Lab. Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes. Yeah. At Sac State. Perfect. And then uh, Dragon Lair asked, "How massive, or have you tried a massive water change uh, with cooler water to trigger the Nancarnia, Nancarna?" Nanakara? Nanakara, um, yes. I haven't. Um, the trouble with that fish is, uh, I actually saw them recently. Normally, oh, with the Nanakara. Oh, sorry, I was thinking the I, I, Ivanakara. Um, I have with the Nanakara. Yeah, I'll take like half the water out, and. Um, the challenge with the fish like that, for a person like me who has seen tens of thousands of fish eggs, it's hard to see the eggs. For a student who's never spawned a fish, the odds that they're actually going to see those eggs are close to zero. And uh, But that's what I'm here for, is to get the students to learn to do this. So, I mean, I could do it, but to get them to do it and to teach them so we're going to keep doing it until they learn to do it yeah now i get that it's a and, great little fish too oh yeah definitely and then uh ca benner something similar but have you ever tried water changes or uh drastic temperature swings to induce spawning so uh one of the interesting things about being in a very old building this building was built in the uh, early 1950s and if you think back None of you were around. I wasn't even around in the 1950s. But um, nothing plugged in in the 1950s, okay? And so there's almost no electricity in this building. So um, just a second. Speaking of which, my computer says it's going to die, and I'm not quite sure why. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, to give you an idea, uh, the fish room, there's actually three fish rooms. That wasn't, oops, that wasn't clear. There's three fish rooms, okay? Uh, one of the fish rooms, the end one, has exactly one electrical outlet for um, about 40 tanks. That, that's pushing it. <laughs> yeah, so we have to be very, very careful about, um, so I'll put a little bit of heat in this one, a little bit of heat in that one, and all that. I, I can't put heaters in every tank. I can't, there just isn't enough electricity in this lab. And it turns out in this building, and it turns out in this end of the university, because it's the old end of the university, they have to put in a new trunk line, and they're not uh, interested in spending, you know, two hundred thousand dollars for that. Is the uh, spot that you're saying you're going to move to possibly soon newer in that situation, or? Yeah, it's got a little bit more electricity. A little more electrical power. Uh, but in smaller space. That's the, oh, that's the, that's the downside. Smaller space. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah. and then Larry asked, "What do you do with all your convict fry?" Because I know, like, even at our club, sometimes you cannot get anyone to buy the bag. <laughs> yeah, well, so one of the groups of uh, cichlids that we work with are the pike cichlids, and um, they love convict fry. <laughs> that nice little snack for them. Yeah, there's a little tank over there that's labeled feeder fry, <laughs> and um, yeah, that's that's actually that's one way we've been able to spawn some of the little. Um, the little dwarf pikes, they really love chasing down little fry. That's what does it for them. Yeah. And then I don't know if this was directed at you or not, but Inglorious Better has asked if you wanted, or if you were going to do another Tough Mudder, I want to do one now. So I couldn't do it this year. I actually couldn't do it last year. So it's uh, I've, done, I've done several. Um, yeah, I guess I've done four. Uh, I'm signed up for next year. I, I may die, but uh, I, I do this with my brothers up in British Columbia. The, uh, it's held on the um, course of the uh, Winter Olympics, so you run up and down the ski hills and say, "It's, it's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm getting old though." Yeah, I, I do some running. It's never fun. And, and the, just uh, Gian, just you know, I wear shoes. Gian is in this thing where she does, she runs around without shoes. She's a barefoot runner, huh? She insists that this is good, and I think it would just really hurt. 
yeah, there's a whole scientific study and back end of it. And I, I get that my uncle is doing barefoot. He does a uh, ultra marathon. So like a hundred mile marathons and do. uh, he does some barefoot stuff occasionally. And I wear shoes in the fish lab. You know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm big on shoes. I like shoes. I don't like stepping on things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Larry's asking if you have any photos of fish eggs, uh, maybe from a microscope. I don't know how easily that would be. Uh, Unfortunately, not with me, but um, this is once that. we start meeting again, this is that here. Oh. So the, the lab has a wall of bookshelves, which is basically filled with containers like this, okay. So these we'll, are your uh, egg uh, specimens that you were saving? Yeah, and so each of those, there's like just hundreds and hundreds, if I can get that up there, of containers like this. Well, let me get the angle right. Um, so let's see, this is a match set you have to move backwards here. So let's see if I go that way on the, on the screen on your left are the eggs and on the right, you really can't see it, are the fry of, um, this is Geophagus brasiliensis. And so we just have just tons of these, <laughs> tons and tons and tons of these. Yeah. Just lots of egg samples, huh? Yep. And then uh, Dragon Lair came back. I believe this was in response to the cold water changes, saying that, uh, you know, as that works with many hard to spawn species, as it mimics the rainy, rainy season in the tropics. Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting point. Um, I actually have been studying this for a few years. Um, in the river, in rivers of eastern Costa Rica, what happens is it's, um, it, it, it's not about the. Uh, what it's what it's about is it's about the time between storms and so um, if there's a storm in eastern Costa Rica on the day after the storm you can count on a lot of the fish like the tube spawning and what it is is they're trying to maximize the time for the next storm because their kids have to grow up big enough or else they get wiped out by the storm and so they spawn on the on the back side of the storm. This is different than like the Corydoras that Eric can spawn left and right. Um, they seem to respond to air pressure. And um, but the, the cichlids don't, at least the Central American ones that I know don't do that. It's about being predicting when the next storm is, which is kind of cool. Would that be like barometric pressure that's adjusting? Is that how they kind of tell that, and or the fish do at least, or is that different? So, I'm not that, super sciencey. So yeah, well, it's an interesting question because the air pressure changes, but that doesn't necessarily change. Like you don't feel that in the water. Oh. Like you wouldn't. You if you're snorkeling in a river or diving in a river, you can't really tell that a thunderstorm has happened over top of you. Okay. And a lot of these fish actually, like the cichlids, don't spawn in the rainy season. They, they, they want to spawn in the in the dry, but not the really dry. It's it's, it's a whole other talk there. But yeah, <laughs> been investigating for a while. It's very interesting. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, I keep losing my spot. Uh, TD was pointing out uh, what you use for preservation. Can you go over that just a little bit on like what what the whole oh, situation yeah. so, there is? So, um, I started a thing called the Cichlid Egg Project. It is frighteningly long ago. It was in uh, 1995, so that's uh, oh, 25 years. I've been doing that, yeah, 25 years. And uh, at the time, I needed, uh, so people contribute eggs from all over the world to this project. So we have the eggs of getting on close to 400 species now. And um, I needed something that would preserve the same for all of them and uh, was readily available. And two, two things actually work really well. One is vodka, <laughs> and that seems to be universally available in every country. And even no matter where you are in the wild, you can 
or um, uh, 70 percent isopropyl. Seventy percent But which, uh, beer doesn't work, <laughs> and uh, so I had tried all these different things. Uh, there's not enough alcohol in beer, but any high high alcohol thing like vodka or or something like that, I guess uh, gin and stuff like that would work as well. So dip into your vodka closet to preserve your fish eggs. Yeah, so that's for the eggs. For the fry, they don't preserve as well. We, we use 5% formalin. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And then uh, Rich Byler was asking if you have any decent-sized crocodiles in the rivers that you research. Uh, yes, we have a friend uh, who lives in the main river. Haven't seen him in a while. Um, the last time I saw him, a couple of years ago, I had I bring students with me and uh, to the to research and i remember i had told them there were these crocodiles and we're standing on the main bridge over the river and i was explaining how these crocodiles in the river you got to be a bit careful and uh, sarah goes you mean like that one (laughs) and like there it was it was like right on cue it's like yeah just exactly like that one that's exactly what they look like so um yeah we still still got all the fingers well except for that one (laughs) And then uh, Larry's asking, with that many tanks and having to water change by hand, how are you doing it, and who's doing it? Uh, well, I have three people. There's uh, me, myself, and I, uh, but we rotate. So that's only, I only have to do a third of the effort, and then myself does a third of the effort, and I does a third of the effort. And that's pretty much, I mean, that's what we're doing. Sweet. And so, you're, are you just using, like, siphons and buckets, or using pond pumps with, like, a long hose? <laughs> siphons and buckets. Siphons and buckets. Yeah. And is there a specific reason why you do that versus like a pond pump? Is it like keeping the fry or just easier yeah, to control? Yeah, you want to be really careful about, um, you have to be very careful about contaminating things. Um, we've been very lucky that over the years we've, we've had diseases a few times. Um, but it's, it's horrible when you get a disease in a research lab. In a, at Berkeley we had a centralized system. I mean, you get something in there. And you know, there's it's nothing, best to everything. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, so um, yeah, so that's why I have separate tanks. So if something goes bad, or you know, I bring new fish in, they go in their own tank. And um, but it does mean that it's a lot of work. Oh yeah, and yeah. then uh, <laughs> glorious Betta saying, uh, I was wondering the same thing. Doing that many ch- water changes would blow my shoulder out. <laughs> It's uh, it's good exercise. Now I do not do weekly water changes. Um, I wish I could, but I don't. And so I would say that I aim for um, about 25, 40 percent once a month. That's really what I aim for. 25 to 40 once a month. Yeah, and it you know some tank if if there's more fish in the tank, it'll be more often. Some tanks only have two fish. They yeah. can go. And you're not feeding super much. And- no. So they can go six months without a water change. Yeah, and then uh, Jack was asking about the second preservative because of the motorcycle. That was probably on my end. I apologize for oh, that. Oh, yeah, so formaldehyde for the for the fry. Yeah, formaldehyde. Five, formaldehyde, yeah. 5% formaldehyde. Yeah. And then I think we have actually caught to the bottom of the chat, which is good. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, be sure to ask them. And I'm stating this mainly for Ron. There's about a 30 second delay in the YouTube video. So we're just gonna kind of sit here and and smile for a minute until the questions start rolling in, just cause uh, there is that little bit of delay. But Mm -hmm. is there anything else that's kind of pointed out or you might want to clarify that has been asked? Um, Well, I've been doing this for as a scientist for almost 40 years and I still love it. So, and you said you were at Berkeley before this? How long were you at Berkeley before this? I was at Berkeley for about eight years. Eight years. Yeah, yeah. I was at Berkeley. I, I was, came originally from Canada. I was at, at University of Toronto. Um, so I've been around various places and uh, Sacramento is a great place to be. Oh, yeah. And, uh, we're, we are very lucky to have the club that we do. We have a great fish club. Absolutely great fish. I've, I've been to a handful, not a ton, but a handful. And uh, Sacramento is definitely a special one. I, I will tell you that um, I'm also on the board of the American Cichlid Association, and uh, of course we were supposed to have the, you know, ACA. the big convention. <laughs> um, so we had a board meeting last week, last Saturday, and people were sad that they couldn't be here. Um, I know at first when we said we weren't going to have it, there were some people like, you know, you should have it, know that, and no one's saying that now. Everyone is like, <laughs> there is no way anyone 
would have gotten a plane come here right now. That just wouldn't even have uh, been a start. And to be perfectly honest, so next year it is being held in uh, uh, St. Louis. It's going to be a smaller convention. And even right now, they're not sure how many people will get on a plane. They're fully expecting that no one will get on a plane. And that's supposed to be July next year? Yeah, July next year. And then it's going to be in Louisville the year after. And we're hopeful that we'll be back to some sort of normal or something for Louisville. But um, yeah, you know, people around the country are trying to do the best they can. I've seen uh, some clubs are actually holding um, curbside auctions. I, I know we've been talking about that a little bit. Kind of an interesting idea, sort of a drive-through auction thing. I don't know if that's... See, I know the problem that at least was brought up without saying too much, uh, we have a very large club. And so yeah. that's the one concern that I know has been is we have, I mean, we have what, 70 people plus at a meeting normally. And yeah. uh, that, you know, we might might have quite a bit if we do a, a parking lot. We might have to take over a parking lot. I do appreciate, I want to say right here publicly, I do very much appreciate what you're doing, Michael. This, you know, we're, we're pushing forward, we're finding a way to make it work. Um, that's great. That is Thank absolutely you. Great. Appreciate it. We're going to be in this for a bit. Yeah, well, I'm enjoying doing it. It's it's getting me to, to places I haven't been and, and talking to people that I haven't talked to. So, um, plus there's people in our meetings that aren't normally in our meetings, and that's always fun too. So, and then uh, let's see. It looks like everyone is pretty much finishing up. There's a couple more. Uh, we're gonna throw another plug in here. Wiley's pointing out: Has everyone bought a Sacramento Aquarium Society mask? They are available on our Teespring store, um, and there is a discount code that is somewhere. I don't know where exactly it is. I have it right here, and I'm going to drop it in the chat, just like that. And, uh, yeah, and then Dan came in and said that when the club is doing better, he's hoping to possibly look into offering some small scholarships. Does your lab already have a scholarship program or anything like that? Do we have a, do we have a scholarship program? No, we don't have... <laughs> We don't have any money. <laughs> it takes um, money to give out money, right? Yeah. No. What what we do is, um, I very strongly encourage my students to apply for um, they're called small money grants in different places that offer them, and um, they they do this, and they've been successful. And it's it's not only it has a tremendous value. Just so you know, if you are considering this. The money is great. It, the ego boost that it does for a young person to know that someone felt what, that their ideas were worth something, you can't match that. And I know some of my students that have gotten those grants have gone on to do um, PhDs. One of them is actually a dean uh, who started out in my lab. Oh, wow. At the, at the community college in the Bay Area. Okay. And th this is how, how, oh, there are the lights on. <laughs> um, this is how you move people along. You, you, you give them a little bit of a boost and you say that you believe in them and, and they, they take it from there. So thank you very much. Motivation's a lot. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Jonathan Wardrop's asking, what's your favorite soda uh, spot in s Costa Rica? Oh, man. I don't know. They, um, Costa Rica changes all the time. Every year we're there, something different. Everything is different. Um, yeah, it's 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 a third world country, but it's developing quickly. They're they're doing the best they can. Uh, interestingly, and I don't know how this is going to play out, they have declared that two years from now there will be no gasoline powered cars in the country. That but I don't know. That'll be interesting. All be electric. That's what they're saying. 100% electric in Costa Rica in two years. And I don't know how that's going to work because um, even with gas, there's some places where it's a long way between gas stations. And I don't know what you'd do if you ran out of electricity. <laughs> in your car. You know, if your battery, I don't know what you'd do. Uh, but this is this is they are they are trying very hard to lead the world, and um, this sort of stuff. That's cool. 
And uh, Larry's asking, do you mostly feed off your excess fry or do you get them into the hobby? I'm assuming he means put them in like a, an auction or a fish store or send them home with someone. To be perfectly honest, most of the fry um, end up in little Grinnesick bellies. And then uh, Dragon Lair asked, what's the species of Nanakaria again and are they available to the hobby keeper? I uh, love trying to breed them and breeding fish since the early 70s. So the, there's Nanakara anomala. That's the regular Nanakara that has been around for a long time. They're, they're great, maybe big male, like a monster male is like two inches, you know. And um, they seem to do well in a, in a heavily planted tank and they just find a place to spawn in there and they just keep raising brood after brood and you end up with a I mean, tank fly. One time I remember years ago, I put two in an A. When I tore the tank down, I had 30 of them. Just, they're just, you know, the they're just everywhere. <laughs> the, the, the cousin is a thing called Ivano Cara. So Ivan Akara and Adokita. There's only one of them. And it is like a Nanakara on super color steroids and they are just gorgeous little fish it's absolutely gorgeous mm -hmm. um, i have not spawned them yet i see youtube videos every now and then that some people have but i have not yet so it's possible just haven't gotten there theoretically possible <laughs> all right and then let's see i think that is pretty much it um i'm going to do another plug for uh, Sacramento Aquarium Society. Again, we've got a promo code for our merchandise on our Teespring store. I've got it up on the screen right now. Uh, good through midnight tomorrow. And then um, we also have, you can go to our website, sacramentoaquariumsociety.info, and there's a PayPal donation if you want to donate. I usually go and donate my bridge toll and gas that I would normally spend getting up there um, just to kind of push a little bit to the club, and um, it's always appreciated that way. So, yeah. And then I think that's pretty much it if Wiley wants to hop back on to uh, his camera. Is there anything else you want to say, Ron? No, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. I very much appreciate it. And when things are a little bit more normal, you are certainly welcome to come by. Just shoot me an email and, and you know, come see what's, what's going on here. I can't promise the tanks will be perfectly clean, but there will be something interesting. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, uh, and I just want to say thanks for, uh, for hosting our uh, auctions and everything like that. You do a good job, and I know that's – I talk a lot here, and it kills my voice. I can't imagine doing the auction for three hours and <laughs> doing all that. You do a good job at it. So. Thank you. Yeah. And then it looks like Wiley's back. And so I think I'm going to go ahead and say uh, goodbye to everyone. And if, Ron, you want to do the same, I'm going to pull us off the screen. Thank and you, And let Wiley close it out. Thanks everybody for coming. I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, the the presentation and the talk. Uh, just a reminder to everyone uh, that uh, we do have masks, t-shirts, fanny packs, towels, hoodies. I even uh, put a, a hoodie for your doggy on there. Um, so everybody go and pick something up. Uh, reminder: next month is Rich Byerly's barn of fish o's uh he's got a pool in there full of fish uh, i'm going to try to push him in see if he can swim um so there's a lot of fun to look forward to that and then um oh my grandson his mom came and got him so uh <laughs> but um so that's next month and then uh, we will be doing a test auction sometime at the end of the month. So look for that. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed everything. And I look forward to talking with all of you on Facebook. And you are all always welcome to reach out. And I will always be there to try to talk. So you all have a wonderful month. Stay healthy. Stay cool. And talk to you next time. Bye-bye.